welcome to this video on Redux. My name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloyTutors.com and this video is going to be a revision video uh, and it's going to cover, like I say, the uh, subject of Redux for elements from the C topic or ES um, for OCR B salters. Now, um, these slides that I'm going to be using here, they are available to purchase a really good value for money. Um, and you can use them for your revision. You can get a whole series of them for AS at a discount as well. If you just click on the description box in the link, um, uh, so you click on the link in the description box, and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. But like I say, these are dedicated to the OCRB Salters specification, and they meet these specification points, as you can see here. Okay, so we're going to start with electrolysis. Quite a big chunk on electrolysis, so you really need to know what's going on here regarding electrolysis. Okay, basically electrolysis is the breaking down of a substance using electricity. So electro meaning electricity, lysis meaning to break something, okay? So electrolysis can be conducted using ionic compounds that are either molten or they are dissolved in solution. Um, and this is because the ions are free to move around. That allows them to conduct electricity um, you also need a free um, flow of electrons as well. Um, so things like metallic uh, bonding has free moving electrons that can conduct electricity. Uh, things like graphite as well, that can conduct electricity uh, because it has free electrons between the layers. So, um, and you'll see graphite can be used um, in electrolysis for electrodes for that reason. So we've got two electrodes in electrolysis. We've got the anode. Uh, this is the positive electrode. And negative ions, which are anions, um, these are attracted to the anode and these give up electrons. Whereas the cathode, this is a negative electrode and the positive ions, which are cations, uh, are attracted to the cathode and they receive electrons. Now you can remember this as cations are positive, a bit like cats and paws, so you can kind of remember it like that. Uh, and that may help you to remember that cations are positive and obviously anions will be negative as a result. Okay, and it has to be set up in a very specific way. Okay, you've got to be really, really careful to make sure you get the results that you desire. Okay, so the first thing is you connect your power supply to the electrodes. Um, so you can see here that we're using to, you can use a, a power pack. This is just to symbolize a power pack, really. Uh, the positive end uh, of the power supply will create the positive electrode, as you can see here, and the negative will create the negative electrode, as you can see there. So um, that just gives you an idea of which way around it is. Okay, so the electrodes are made from inert conductive materials, so platinum and graphite. This is what we were talking about before, graphite being a good conductor of electricity. Um, it has to be inert to stop it reacting with the electrolyte, which is this solution here. We don't want it reacting, we just want it to conduct electricity. So the electrodes are dipped into the electrolyte, but they mustn't touch. We don't want the electricity to just go through the circuit. We want the um, electricity to, or the, the charge to be carried through the solution, not straight through these. And all we do is turn on the power supply uh, and you'll see substances collecting at the electrodes. As you can see, um, obviously these are the electrodes here. Um, solids will plate the electrode um, if we get the solid produced. Um, and we get obviously a thin layer coating it around it. And bubbles will show that a gas has been produced because sometimes we get gases made. Okay, so the reactions at each electrode, they can be shown using what we call a half equation. So half equations show the movement of electrons and they show what's happening at each electrode. So you can see here the anode, which is this one, the positive electrode, um, the negative ions, they give up electrons to form atoms. So an example might be bromide ions, Br- minus, because they're negatively charged. They're going to be attracted to the positive electrode. They will give up two electrons to form bromine. So you'll see uh, bromine vapor being given off um, at this electrode. Whereas at the cathode, the positive ions, these accept electrons to form atoms. So you can see here Pb2+, plus, uh, accepted two electrons to form lead, um, which is obviously Pb. So you'll see collection of lead or plating across the cathode. Okay, so electrolysis and molten substances. Now this is the relatively straightforward one. Uh, the one with solutions is a little bit more complex as you'll see in a minute. But electrolysis and molten substances produce elements that make up the ionic compound. So it's pretty straightforward, this one. So for example, if we take sodium chloride, um, what we'll produce is sodium and chlorine gas. So sodium at the cathode and uh, chlorine gas at the anode. So there we go. At the anode, the Cl minus ions, remember, attracted to the positive anode. Um, so you see here we've got 
two Cl minus forming Cl two plus two electrons. So um, obviously the electrons have been produced. Um, electrons are released here, and we form chlorine gas. And at the cathode, we get Na plus ions are attracted to the obviously negative cathode. So uh, Na plus picks up an electron to form sodium metal. So we'll see sodium that's been collecting uh, that's collecting around here. So this is if it's molten. Okay, so if we melt it. <coughs> okay, it gets a little bit difficult when we've got aqueous solutions, okay, because we have now uh, extra ions to contend with. We've got OH minus ions and H plus ions, okay. So these have come from the water because we've dissolved our salt or substance, whatever the substance is, in water. We've now got these two ions to think about. So you've got to be really careful with this one. Okay, so you've got to focus for this bit. <laughs> you ready? So the products formed at each electrode is dependent on the reactivity of the ions and the concentration of the salt solution. Okay, so there's two things which it depends on. Right, so you now you need to really concentrate for this bit. So at the cathode, if the metal is less reactive than hydrogen, you will form a metal here. Okay, so there's the reactivity series. So any one of these metals here that's less reactive than hydrogen, you'll actually form the metal. If the metal's more reactive than hydrogen, which is up here, you'll actually form hydrogen gas. Uh, and this is formed from H plus ions from the water. So that's quite a few metals, as you can see. Now at the anode, the other side, the um, if the solution doesn't contain a halide ion, okay, which is chloride, bromide, iodide, then oxygen is formed. Um, and this comes from the OH minus from the water. And uh, if the solution is concentrated uh, and has a halide ion, then the halogen is formed. So we get obviously chloride, uh, chlorine, sorry, bromine, iodine, etc. If the um, salt solution is dilute though, then actually we get oxygen that has been formed. So you've got to be really careful and look out for the conditions required um, and make sure you're aware of these conditions and what you actually form because this can get a little bit tricky as you can see. Okay, so electrolysis, it can be useful because we can purify certain metals. Copper is a, cr a classic example of this. So here we go, here's the uh, electrode set up again. So the anode is made from impure copper, as you can see here, there it is there. So we've got some copper with other stuff in there as well. And the cathode is actually made from pure copper, which is this bit here. Now at the anode, we've got copper losing. Uh, so copper loses the um, electrons, so this should say two electrons, should I say, uh, rather than TO, so TWO. Uh, so these loses two electrons to make copper ions which dissolve in solution. Okay, so these dissolve. And you can see here Cu forms Cu2 plus plus two electrons. So they're being given up. So the anode will actually wear away and become lighter. So the copper from here uh, effectively um, breaks down into copper two plus ions which then fall into this solution here and obviously two electrons. Because the copper's been used up, the anode gets smaller. At the cathode, so the copper actually, uh, the copper ions that were given up from here, uh, they actually gain electrons at the at the cathode, and they become copper again. So it's like recycling, and this actually plates the cathode. You can see it being plated around the end here. So the copper two plus ions picks up the two electrons to form copper. Uh, this one will obviously get heavier because we've got deposits on the bottom there. Okay, electrolysis of brine. So some halogens like chlorine, these can be extracted through electrolysis of brine. Okay, so we just um, we pass electricity through brine and brine can be obtained from seawater as we'll see in a minute. So brine is just a really high concentration solution of salts such as chlorides, bromides and iodide salts. So these are halide based salts. And like I say, brine can be found from seawater um, and the salt actually, the reason why the sea is salty is because um, the river courses uh, will dissolve some of the minerals from the rocks as it runs down the um, obviously the course of the river uh, and then when it runs into the estuary into the mouth of the river um, then uh, obviously we've got loads and loads of ions that have been built up as the rivers run through and then this enters into the sea and obviously in the sea we have lots of salt uh, and obviously the salt we can use and we can extract halogens from it so that's pretty useful um, I'm sure um, all you geographers out there, if you do geography, you'd probably be screaming at us now and saying, well, that's not, um, they're not the proper terms. Um, but um, there we go. All you need to know, really, is that you've got your uh, your salts that have come from rocks 
uh, and they're minerals from rocks. And that's about it. So this is chemistry. Right. So at the cathode, um, we've got H plus ions from the water. These make hydrogen gas. Okay. So we've got uh, two lots of H plus plus two electrons forming hydrogen gas. So we get bubbles giving off here at the negative electrode. Now at the anode, uh, we've got Cl minus ions from the salt. These make chlorine gas. Remember them rules that we were talking about. Um, obviously, we've got a halide-based uh, salt here, so we form the halogen at the positive, uh, positive anode. Um, so we've got two Cl minus forming Cl2 plus two electrons. So in the solution, then what's left behind here is we've got sodium ions. These are more reactive than hydrogen. So they remain in solution. And what they do is they react with the hydroxide ions. These are found in the water, obviously the one the water splits. And this makes sodium hydroxide, which can actually be used to make soap. So it's quite a few uh, uses of this stuff here. And obviously our electrodes can either be platinum or graphite. Um, either one, because they're good conductors of electricity. But remember they're inert. They don't actually react with the substances that, we're, that we've put into the beaker. So it's pretty useful. <clears throat> okay. So sodium chloride solutions, they must be concentrated, okay? This is really, really important. So we can only obtain chlorine via electrolysis when the solution is concentrated. Remember, again, from them rules, it has to be concentrated to form the halogen. If it isn't, we form oxygen instead. So if the solution is dilute, like I say, the chloride ions don't release their electrons. Uh, instead, the OH minus ions lose their electrons and water and oxygen is produced instead. Like I say, we'll see bubbles. The bubbles won't be chlorine, they'll be oxygen gas. So you've got to be really careful if it was dilute. Uh, and this is the reaction showing that. So there's your hydroxide ions that would be in the solution anyway from the water. What you'd form is two molecules of water, oxygen gas, and obviously four electrons being released. So it's the OH minus releasing the electrons rather than the chloride ions, which you want to form chlorine or bromine or iodine, depending on what you want to make. Okay, so let's have a look at the extraction of bromine and iodine. So we looked at the chlorine once. Let's look at bromine and iodine here. Um, we can use what we call displacement reactions to do this. So the extraction of bromine. So if we use a more reactive halogen, then we can extract bromine from its brine. So chlorine is more reactive than bromine. It's higher up in the uh, group seven, so it's more reactive. Um, and basically, bromine is produced, which is then condensed and then purified into a liquid. So we take any of the impurities out of it. And this is the reaction here. There's your bromide ions. Chlorine's more reactive than bromide ions. This will come from the salt. So then what we form is bromine. Uh, this would be a vapor. This would be vaporized. Obviously, we condense it uh, back into a liquid because it's a liquid at room temperature uh, and Cl minus ions as well. Um, obviously, this has been displaced. Similar thing with iodine, actually. Um, we're just going to use a more reactive halogen. We can also extract iodine from its brine as well. So again, we can use chlorine to do this. Um, it's more reactive than iodine, a good bit more reactive. Um, and again, we get this um, um, solution, we can condense it and we get this gray solid that's produced. And here's the reaction. So you've got two I minus, obviously reacting with chlorine here, this is chlorine. Chlorine's more reactive than iodide, so we get iodine and Cl minus ions. So this is how we do extract iodine, bromine and iodine through a displacement reaction. <clears throat> Okay, so obviously we've seen quite a bit of um, electrons being moved from um, left to right. And actually this kind of fits in nicely with um, re redox, so reduction and oxidation. So basically electrons are transferred when reduction and oxidation occurs. Okay, so we can use the acronym oil rake uh, to help understand what's happening. And you might have seen this before. So oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. So you can see this reaction, um, this is when calcium is burnt completely in oxygen. It involves um, reduction and an oxidation process. So this reaction we can describe as redox. So the reaction um, here is calcium being oxidized because what it's doing is it's losing its electrons. Oxidation is loss. So calcium is losing two electrons to form calcium two plus. And you can see here, this uh, in this reaction, oxygen is being reduced because it's gaining electrons. You can see here O2, it's gaining two electrons to form O2 minus. Now, you've got to know about these agents as well. This is getting a little bit confusing here. So your oxidation is the loss. This is a process. Uh, reduction is a gain, but reducing agents actually lose electrons and are oxidized themselves. 
So um, this is a reducing agent, which is calcium, because it has been oxidized itself. And oxidizing agents are just the opposite. These gain electrons and are reduced themselves. So this, in this example, would be a reducing agent because it's gaining electrons. Make sure you know these two. And it's different to the process of oxidation. An oxidizing agent where oxidation is the loss of electrons, an oxidizing agent gains electrons. Okay, so each element we can assign it an oxidation number or an oxidation state. Uh, and obviously this depends on a set of rules as well. We need to know these rules. So uncombined elements, uh, these are always zero. So for example, Cl2, Fe and O2. Ions, uh, basically it's the oxidation number is the same as the charge of the ion. So Cl minus is minus one, Ca2 plus is plus two. Group ones are always plus one. So for example, potassium and potassium chloride. Group twos are always plus two. So for example, calcium in calcium oxide. Aluminium is always plus three. So for example, in aluminium oxide, aluminium is plus three here. Hydrogen is plus one. So for example, in HF, it's plus one, except in hydrides where it's minus one. Now a hydride is just where a metal, so for example, a group one metal is bonded directly to a hydrogen. So here, hydrogen is actually minus one in this example. And this is because sodium is group one, so it's always plus one. Chlorine is minus one, so for example in potassium chloride, except in a compound with F and O, and it would have a positive value. Now we'll look in a minute later about how we can work that out, but for example, ClF3, chlorine is plus three in this example, um, because fluorine is minus one, and we've got three of them. So like I say, fluorine is always minus one, there's no exception for fluorine, except obviously when it's an element, um, but yeah, KF is um, an example of that. And finally, oxygen is minus two, for example, in lithium oxide, Li2O. However, it's minus one in peroxides and plus two in OF2. So this is an example of a peroxide here, H2O2. Uh, obviously, oxygen is going to have the value of minus one. We've got two of them there, so it's going to be minus two in total. And obviously, each hydrogen is plus one. Okay, so let's use these rules. I've dragged the rules across because there's quite a few of them here. And we're going to work out the oxidation states. So we're going to work out the ones in red. You can see here we've got NH3, and the oxidation state here is going to be plus uh, minus three, sorry, because we've got this is rule six. We've got hydrogen is plus one, we've got three of them, so that's plus three. So nitrogen must be minus three. In H2S, hydrogen again is plus one. We've got two of them, so that's plus two. So sulfur must be minus two in this example. So this again is rule six. O2. This is an uncombined element, as you can see here. So this one's going to be zero. So that makes it pretty straightforward. Uh, H2O2, there's your exception. Look, this is a peroxide. So oxygen is going to be minus one, each individual oxygen. So uh, minus one, two lots of them is minus two. So hydrogen must be plus one individually. H2SO4, uh, a bit more here. Oxygen is minus two. We've got four of them, so it's minus eight. Hydrogen is plus one individually, we've got two of them, so that's plus two. So sulfur must be plus six to make sure it all balances. So you can see here, there's the working out. So oxygen is minus two times four is minus eight. So S in total is plus six. SO4 to minus. Now, basically, you've got to watch for this. All the oxidation states must add up to the overall charge of the molecule. The overall charge here is minus two, so the oxidation states must add up to that. So oxygen's minus two, we've got four of them, so that's minus eight. Now sulfur must be plus six in this example because the overall charge must add up to minus two. So there it is. So you can see here, there's the overall charge. It's minus eight for all the oxygens, so sulfur must be plus six, and this would leave minus two that's left behind. Okay, transition metals, they're a little bit strange. They have variable oxidation states. So we can have a look at this one here. Iron here is plus three individually. Um, as you can see, again, using the same rules, oxygen is minus two, We've got three of them, that's minus six. Each individual iron is plus three. Um, and we call this iron three oxide. The little three in Roman numerals tells us the oxidation state of the iron. It's always positive with Roman numerals, so that's plus three. But looking at this one, this is another one. This is another iron oxide one, except iron here is plus two. It's a different oxidation state. And we can write that as iron two oxide, so with the Roman numerals of two. And obviously that represents a plus two oxidation state. 
Here's another one. This is vanadium oxide. Um, now we call this one vanadium 4 oxide. Again, oxygen is minus 2, but the overall charge is plus 2, so that means vanadium must be plus 4. So um, that's why it's vanadium 4 oxide. And compare that to another vanadium oxide. This is vanadium 5 oxide. Now don't get these two confused. These could be quite confusing. So two lots of minus 2, so that's going to be minus 4. Overall, it's a positive charge, so vanadium must be plus 5 in this case. So this is vanadium 5 oxide. Okay, you also asked to name the systematic names of some of these things as well. So let's look at the systematic name of ClO2 minus. So here it is here. Now we're going to look at rule 9 first of all. Oxygen is minus 2. So we've got two lots of them, which is minus 2. That's minus 4 uh, in total for the oxygen. And then if we look at rule 7, chlorine must be plus 3. Um, as the overall charge must add up to give that minus 1 charge, if you can remember. So chlorine is plus 3. So because the chlorine is bonded to oxygen, um, we actually put 8 on the end of it. So we call this a chlorate uh, ion. And then just to finish it off, we need to assign the oxidation state. So chlorine is the oxidation state of plus 3. So all we do is we call it chlorate 3. And that tells us the oxidation state of chlorine. And obviously we've got oxygen attached to it as well. So it's chlorate 3. Okay, make sure you know these ions as well. You're going to be expected to use these ions and uh, write chemical formula as well. So carbonates, hydroxides, sulfates, SO4, 2 minus, uh, ammonium is NH4 plus, hydrogen carbonate is HCO3 minus, manganate, um, this is manganate 7, MNO4 minus, again, because that's the oxidation state of manganese, um, uh, nitrate or nitrate 5, as it's also known as, NO3 minus, and sulfide is S2 minus. Now these bits here, these are the systematic names with the Roman numerals next to them. So for example, uh, iron three carbonate is given the formula Fe2CO33, um, because obviously we've got iron is in as a plus three charge, carbonate is a, a, a two minus charge to make sure the whole thing balances. We have two ions for and three carbonates. And iron 2 carbonate, as you can see, is a little bit simpler. Uh, iron is plus 2, carbonate is minus 2, so we just need one of each to make sure they balance. Okay, we need to look at oxidation or reduction. And actually, a quicker way of doing it is by looking for oxidation numbers and looking for increase and decreases. So a reduction is a decrease in oxidation number, and oxidation is an increase in oxidation number. So you can see here, we've got this example of sodium reacting with chlorine to form sodium chloride. Uh, let's bring up our oxidation numbers. Sodium has an oxidation state of zero. So does chlorine because they're uncombined elements. Um, so these are just elements effectively. Uh, sodium is combined to chloride. Sodium is plus one. Chlorine is minus one. And you can see here, um, the sodium is, the oxidation number is actually increasing. So we say that sodium has been oxidized. There's an increase in oxidation number. Chlorine is being reduced because there's a decrease or there's a reduction in oxidation number. We've gone from zero to minus one. So this has shown reduction. Now, sodium is the reducing agent because itself has been oxidized and chlorine is the oxidizing agent because itself has been reduced. Okay, so make sure you're able to uh, note down what a reducing agent is and what an oxidizing agent is. Okay, so combining half equations, uh, two half equations can be combined to make a full ionic equation. Um, you just got to make sure that your electrons balance here. That's quite important. So this process is showing uh, oxidation, as you can see. So copper, forming copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons. And this is showing a reduction process. Um, obviously oxygen picking up two electrons to form O2 minus. Now all we have to do is cancel these two electrons out. We just need to get rid of them and then we combine the two equations. So everything on the left hand side of the arrow will be written on the left and everything on the right hand side of the arrow will be written on the right. Like that. Okay, but really important notice we shouldn't have any electrons at all in this final ionic equation. And we don't, which is pretty good. And obviously your full ionic equation, this is shown both reduction and oxidation. This is the redox reaction because we'll combine the oxidation and reduction process together. Um, and you can see here that we've got the Cu2 plus an O2 minus written separately. These will effectively combine and form um, copper oxide. <coughs> okay. 
So charges, as well as atoms, have to be balanced in redox equations as well. Now, this is relatively straightforward. It looks probably more complicated than what it is, but uh, hopefully with my explanation, you'll be able to understand what's going on. So we're going to balance the following reaction. You can see we've got Fe3 plus plus I minus will form Fe and I2. Now, the first thing we have to do is balance the atoms. So what we're going to do is just put a 2 in front of there because you can see the iodine isn't balanced. So we'll put the 2 in front of there. Then we have to check on the charges on the left and on the right. And you can see here the charges here, we've got plus three there. We've got two lots of minus one there. So overall, that's plus one. And this is neutral on this side. So you can see the charges don't balance. So then what we have to do is we have to work out the changes in oxidation states. So for um, the element for um, iron, obviously we're going to make iron. The oxidation state at the start was plus three, because that's three plus. Uh, the final oxidation state is zero, so the total change is minus three. That's the change, and that's obviously been reduced. And your iodine um, initially was two lots of minus one, which is minus two in total. Final oxidation state is zero because that's an element. So the total charge, total change here is plus two. So this has been oxidized. Then what we have to do is multiply uh, to cancel out the oxidation state change. So if you see here, if we multiply this one by two we get minus six, and if we multiply this bottom one by three, we get plus six, and these this will allow us to cancel these two out because they're opposite charges. So we're gonna multiply the Fe by two, multiply the um, the I2 by three, and that will get us our uh, opposite charges. And obviously we need to multiply, use these numbers to multiply the species in the equation. So we multiply all the Fe species by two, so we'll put a two there and a two there, and then we multiply all the I species by three, so that's going to turn into 6, because that's 2 times 3, which is 6, and that's just going to be 3 on there. So let's have a look at the final equation. So it looks something like this. 2Fe3 plus 6I minus will produce 2Fe and 3I2. As you can see, it's all balanced. Okay, so looking at this kind of final step, really, which is the iodine sodium thiosulfate titration. Now, this is one hell of a titration, okay? It's quite big. There's a lot of steps here, and I hope that through breaking it down into three distinct um, steps, we should be able to explain what's going on, okay? But this titration is useful for finding out the concentration of an oxidizing agent. So you can see here, we're gonna break it down to three steps. So uh, step one is basically, we're gonna use the oxidizing agent, uh, which is KiO3, to oxidize the iodide ions to iodine. We're then gonna carry out the titration, work out the moles of iodine produced in step one. That's the whole point of doing this titration. And then once we've done that, we're gonna use the moles of iodine in step two, what we worked out from the titration, to work out the concentration of IO3 minus ions. Okay, and this was effectively right from the start. So I think it kind of all loops back on itself. Okay, so step one. What we have to do is um, we're going to measure out a volume of KiO3, which is potassium iodate 5. This is your oxidizing agent. Okay, and this will produce the IO3 minus because it's a salt, so it'll dissociate. Okay, uh, usually you'd use about 25 centimeters cubed, but it could be any volume. You're probably more likely to see it's 25 centimeters cubed. And then what we're going to do is add um, excess acidified potassium iodate solution to the, uh, the potassium iodate 5 solution. And here's the reaction here. So effectively, there's the IO3 minus. This is our oxidizing agent we're talking about. Uh, we're going to react that with iodide ions. That's come from the potassium iodate, uh, potassium iodide. Sorry, It's in excess, as you can see. We've got 5 to 1. So you see we've got loads more of this compared to this. Uh, we're we're going to have, obviously, H plus ions here because this balances up the charges. Uh, and, um, obviously, water and iodine is produced. So the I minus ions, effectively, are oxidized to I2. And, obviously, this has been the oxidizing agent. So, basically, the more concentrated the oxidizing agent is, so the more of this we've got, then the more I minuses we will get oxidized. Okay, so, basically, we're trying to measure the strength of this. And we've got to have enough of these to take into account the strength of this, in other words, to work it out. If we didn't have enough of these, then maybe some of this left over. So we want to use up all of this as much as we can, and basically we should have some of this left over. So basically we're just measuring how much, how strong is this, and the stronger this is, the more iodine we're going to get. Okay, so 
then what we're going to do is going to look at step two okay so actually we've done this we've used the oxidizing agent to oxidize iodide to iodine so we've got that fine so what we're going to do is we're going to add the solution from step one that we've just made we're going to tip that into a conical flask so in it goes in there remember we've got 25 centimeters cubed to that we're going to add sodium thiosulfate uh, into the conical flask i'm going to look out for this pale yellow color now sodium thiosulfate is in our burette we're going to add it until we get this very like straw like color this pale yellow color and basically as the color change is really difficult to see uh, right, right, just when it goes that yellow color we're going to add two centimeters cubed of starch this turns this really deep blue color it's really obvious you can definitely see it um, and basically this is all this is doing is the starch is reacting with any iodine that's still there um, if there's iodine there it will go bluey black okay and that's why you want to do it just um, you know as soon as you get that yellow color you want to add that in okay uh, and basically you just keep adding until that blue color disappears and that means you haven't got any iodine left in that flask so basically this is reacting with the iodine that you've made from step one so all of the iodine like i say is reacted and we can use the volume of sodium thiosulfate added to work out how many moles of iodine did we actually have in this flask okay so this is the reason why and obviously once we know the number of moles of that we can then obviously that will help us to work out the number of moles of the iodide ions uh, so the iodate um, five ions which is the oxidizing agent from step one so let's look at the calculation so let's look at this as an example so all the iodine reacted and it reacted with 10 and a half centimeters cubed of 0 0.140 moles per decimeter cubed of thiosulfate solution so we've got this in here so this is the reaction we're going to be using so the iodine that was in this flask is reacting with the thiosulfate ions which is in here and what this is going to do is it's going to uh, reduce the iodine to I minus and this is oxidized your thiosulfate is oxidized to this so this is effectively what we're doing we're turning it back to I minus ions okay so this equation like I say it shows what's happening in the titration so the iodine reacting with the thiosulfate so what we have to do first is we need to work out the number of moles of thiosulfate we have the information to do that so number of moles is uh, concentration times volume uh, remember we need to divide by a thousand to get it into decimeters cubed so concentration is 0 0.140 okay that's the concentration we used times by 10.5 now 10.5 was the volume in centimeters cubed we have to convert that to decimeters cubed so we divide by a thousand and we should get that many moles of thiosulfate now once we've done that we can then work out the number of moles um, of iodine that we actually had in the flask at the start so the moles of thiosulfate they react in a two to one ratio as you can see here so we've got with iodine so we've got one mole of iodine reacts with two moles of your um, thiosulfate ions so what that means is the number of moles of iodine is just 1.47 times 10 to the minus three moles divided by two and that tells us that we had 7.35 times by 10 to the minus four moles of iodine in this flask and that was made from step one remember okay i hope you're following so far right we're now going to move on to the the third step and basically because now we know the moles of iodine we're going to now work out um, the concentration of io3 minus ions so here we go so remember just as a reminder the moles of iodine that we calculated was 7.35 times to the tenth of minus four moles and we used 25 centimeters cubed of that oxidizing agent remember so here's the equation from step one again this is the one that we looked at right at the start just as a reminder uh, and basically in step three what we have to do is we look back at our original equation from step one this will be used to work out the number of moles of io3 minus ions and then once we know the number of moles of that we can then work out the concentration told you it's a big titration didn't i right so three moles of iodine are produced from one mole of io3 minus ions so there's your io3 minus that was our oxidizing agent we used right at the start and we know that produced three moles of iodine so we have a three to one ratio so basically the number of moles of io3 minus ions is just going to be the moles of iodine that we worked out in step two divided by three so it's going to be 7.35 times per 10 to the minus four divide that by three and we're going to get 2.45 times by 10 to the minus four moles of io3 minus now finally because we know the number of moles we can work out the concentration of this oxidizing agent so the concentration remember is moles divided by volume the volume's got to be in decimeters cubed remember 
So the number of moles is 2.45 times 10 to the minus 4. That's what we've just worked out there. Divided by the volume number we used initially was 25 centimetres cubed of this oxidising agent. Convert that to decimetres cubed by dividing by 1,000. And so our concentration is 9.8 times by 10 to the minus 3 moles per decimetres cubed. And that is the concentration of the original um, uh, oxidising agent that we used from step 1. So you can see it's quite an involved reaction. There's a lot of steps here, but I hope I hope that was quite logical in terms of how we can break it down into these three distinct stages. Because they do, if you look at it all at one, it looks like an absolute nightmare. So trying to break it down and trying to say why we're calculating these things is really important. Okay, well obviously we need to know, obviously we're doing this practical, we need to know we're doing it properly and we need to have a thorough practical technique and there's some little tips here to make sure that you are doing it correctly. So the first thing is obviously when we're doing this titration, because we've got thiosulfate in that burette, we need to rinse up the burette with thiosulfate prior to titration. This basically removes any uh, water that might be in there after you've washed it previously. Uh, obviously water will dilute that thiosulfate um, and obviously give you a concentration lower than what you think it is. Uh, obviously when you're reading uh, your the level of sodium thiosulfate, um, we always read from the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, you can see the meniscus here and it always at eye level. So in this case, this is actually reading 20 centimetres cubed, not 19.8 centimetres cubed, as you can see on there. So we're reading at the bottom of the meniscus. Always record your results to two decimal places. Um, you repeat the results um, until you get um, three results that are concordant with each other. So what we mean by concordant is we mean that they are plus, they are within 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. Uh, and obviously once we've got our results, we then take an average of them three results that are concordant of each other as well. Uh, your conical flask, um, you obviously have to uh, wash this um, between repeat experiments. You don't want any um, impurities in there. You're obviously adding starch in there. You want to get rid of that. You want to start afresh, make sure it's thoroughly clean and then start again and dry it out as well. Uh, we're going to use freshly made solutions as well. Um, they do react with oxygen if left for a while, so you have to really crack on with this one. As soon as you've made your solutions, you get on with your titration. Uh, otherwise, um, you're going to get oxidation, um, particularly if you're thiosulfate, and you don't want that because you're going to have less thiosulfate ions in here, and you're going to get that false impression of a, um, you get effectively going to get a weaker solution. And also, the really important thing, remember we talked about the starch being added. We've got to add that to when it just turns yellow. We can't add it right from the start. Um, and this is because the um, the iodine um, will actually interact with the starch more um, and won't actually react with the um, thiosulfate solution. So because it's, and we want the iodine, remember, to react with the thiosulfate. So basically we only add it when we get that pale yellow color is formed. Okay, we don't want to add it any sooner than that. I know it's tempting to do so, but you've got to kind of be patient with it. Okay, and that's it. Um, that is a summary of the uh, redox uh, part of the um, Salters uh, ES uh, topic. Um, please subscribe to this channel. It's really great for your support. Um, everything's all free on here, as you can see. Just click on the, um, the circle in the middle and you get all the updates and the videos that we're adding as well. Uh, and just a reminder that these slides can be purchased. Uh, just click on the link in the description box. They're really great value for money, great for your vision, and help you get that A or A star that you need. But that's it. Bye-bye.